we're going to talk a little bit about trusted execution environments. And um, the need for trusted execution environments comes from the fact that I'm sure that you are all well aware, we're putting more and more uh, part of our daily activities inside computers and, and specifically also today inside smartphones. It could be uh, more benign things like watching uh, streaming videos, but could be more uh, critical things like uh, very sensitive communication in um, instant messaging apps and um, uh, economic transactions. For example, you can control your bank account, have payment systems inside, of us, uh, inside your smartphones, and you want to be able to protect them. And actually, in recent years, there have been a lot of effort by uh, most companies in order to make those uh, smartphones more and more secure. However, as we repeatedly see time and time again, uh, advanced attackers, it could be nation state, it could be uh, companies like uh, NSO, are still able to break um, all of the current uh, mitigations and protections and compromise the entire system. And this means that we are in a problem. Uh, and uh, protecting this is very hard because the attack surface is huge. We have very complex um, systems and software, we have uh, browsers, we have uh, videos, and it's very hard to protect everything. So, um, are, is everything lost? And the response uh, from, for example, from Intel, ARM, AMD, is that uh, we can try to do something a little bit different. And basically, what we can do is we're going to have two uh, separate environments on our devices, and this is, for example, the ARM trust zone that is used in Android. And we're going to have the normal world where we have all of our regular applications. And we're going to have the secure world, which is going to be completely separated from the normal world. And it's going to have a much more limited functionality, for example, protection and use, uh, usage of uh, cryptographic keys. So hopefully it will be easier to protect it. And then even if the entire um, user space and kernel of our Android device is compromised, um, things that are protected by uh, the trust zone environment can still uh, remain secure. And we're going to see several use cases for why is it, is it still important. So our research question was relatively simple. Does this work? Does uh, put algo protected cryptographic keys, um, do they still remain secure if the normal world is completely compromised? And the other question is, is it interesting? Are there any real use cases where we should have been protected even if the Android was uh, completely uh, compromised? Um, and and uh, do we, we should have had some uh, security guarantees provided by the Tasson, and does, uh, does it actually break now uh, by higher level protocols? So we we'll start by a small description of how do we actually protect keys uh, in Tasson. And uh, Trust Zone, uh, we have an, what we call TA or Trusted Applet, uh, applet um, which is called the Key Master. And uh, the way they protect keys is uh, basically they don't have any long-term storage or something like that. They don't, really, they don't uh, want to handle the state. So everything is controlled by the Android environment. So the Android um, operating system is going to request uh, Trust Zone to generate a new key. Um, trust will, uh, uh, the trust on environment will, for example, generate a private public uh, keeper, and then it's going to send um, the, uh, the keys back to the Android environment. In order to protect them, we're going to encrypt those keys or uh, wrap them in what's called a secure blob. So basically, we're going to encrypt the public key, going to send it back to the Android uh, operating system, which will handle all of the long-term storage and everything that, uh, and the actual usage. So now we have an encrypted key, but we actually want to do things with it. So one thing that we can do is um, try to have this attestation process where the trust zone is going to attest to the fact that this key was actually generated securely inside the trust zone. This allows um, the Android environment to prove to third parties that um, we're using keys that were actually um, generated uh, securely. And then we, actually want, we also want to use those keys. So how do we do it? Again, we're going to send the encrypted blob to the trust zone and ask him, as, as trust, zone, trust zone, can you please do this operation? For example, can you provide me with a signature? The key will be decrypted inside the trust zone. The signature will also be calculated inside the trust zone environment, and then we're going to send back the result. 
And the main thing here is that the plain text key material, the private key in this case, should never leave the uh, trust zone operating system. It should, al it should always be protected. Um, now, um, although ARM sets the, um, the standard for how is the hardware um, uh, design how it's going to work, the actual implement implementation of the operating system that's run inside the trust zone is something that's left to the different vendors. And this is a very fragmented environment. So even if we only look at Samsung devices, uh, we have at least three different trust zone operating system uh, implemented and uh, written by three different vendors. Um, and, and also with some combinations, for example, at, uh, something that was initially developed by Qualcomm and then Samsung added some more code. So there's a lot of different uh, things to look at. And of course, this is very, very uh, critical, so it's, it should remain secret. So uh, none of the vendors provide any information or code on how they actually implement things inside. Um, so we wanted to take a look at it, and then it meant that we needed to do some kind of reverse engineering. And the first thing that we wanted to find out is how those keys are actually encrypted. And maybe not very surprisingly, uh, the way that those keys are encrypted was using uh, AES-GCM. And uh, the key is, uh, that is used, the hardware-derived uh, key, is something that's used by a key derivation function of um, a root encryption key that is protected in the hardware and all, all, uh, only be accessible inside the trust zone, and some kind of specific salt for the blob. And then we also have an IV, and for, uh, using both of them, we're going to encrypt the key. And the main thing that we wanted to understand is how um, this salt and IV actually generated uh, for the encryption process. So, of course, there are no simple answer for this type of things. So we found out there are three different variants. Um, there's what we call the V15 or V1.5 uh, blob, where we have um, several um, values that are concreted at the hash in order to generate the salt. And the interesting thing about it is that all of those values are completely determined by the um, normal, normal world, by the untrusted Android um, environment. We also have new, newer version called V20 or V2.0, where there are um, two fields that are added, uh, which are not controlled by the Android environment. However, they are constant for all keys that are encrypted, and they are supposed to attest for the state of the device, if it's rooted or not. And in, uh, uh, this is something that we've seen in Galaxy S9, and in all newer Samsung devices, we have the S, um, S, uh, S10 and above, uh, we have the new version, which also add a randomness field. And this randomness is not controlled by the Android environment. So it was a bit confusing, but every time you see a lot of different weird uh, crypt uh, cryptographic design, there's usually some kind of, a, of certification process behind it. And uh, all of those fields are something that's required by the mobile device fundamental protection profile of the common criteria that Samsung um, need to uh, adhere to and the different uh, generation require different things. Okay, so first we try to look at the Samsung S9. And as we mentioned before, the Android client can control the salt because all of the fields that are hashed inside the salt are controlled by uh, the normal world. Uh, what we also find out was that uh, the Android can actually control the IV. Normally it's generated, it's randomly generated inside the trust zone, but you can actually add a field that says, no, please use this IV. And unsurprisingly, uh, if we have a counter mode encryption with a key reuse and IV reuse, we are able to decrypt things. So we have a very, uh, very simple process where we take some uh, wrapped key, we're going to extract the IV and salt that was used for the encryption, and then we can uh, import a new key that we know, uh, we know its value and uh, require the encryption to use the, sa uh, the same salt and the same IV as was used in the, uh, in the unknown key. Then we store everything together, and we can get the key outside. And this is very nice for us, as attackers, not as users. Um, what this means, why is it interesting? Because, for example, uh, when I generate a key, I can also require a trust zone to have specific requirements for me to use them. So, for example, if I have a signature key that can attest to a specific um, uh, uh, transaction, um, and I can ask, Trust to verify uh, my fingerprint before uh, signing it. 
So only if, uh, even if my device was compromised, I still have a secure prompt that will show me this is the transaction. Do you actually want to sign it? And only if I give my fingerprint to the device, um, this will work. But now if we're able to recover the keys, we don't need the user anymore. We can simply take away all of the money. Um, so this works for older devices, specifically S9. And we want to see what happens with the new devices. Are they actually more secure? So uh, again, because there's a randomized, uh, randomized salt, uh, there's no trivial key reuse attack. However, uh, we did find out that there exists latent code that is not used anywhere that allows us to create um, the older version of the V15 blobs, which do not have this randomness. So now uh, what we see is as a privileged attacker, we can do a downgrade attack and force all of the blobs to um, be downgraded to the older and uh, vulnerable version. You can ask again, why is it interesting? Because I'm already controlling the device and it's only for new blobs. So um, for example, we can take the use case of uh, FIDO, web, uh, FIDO to web authentication. It's supposed to um, allow us to authenticate without using uh, passwords. And the main idea here is that we're going to have uh, keys that are, uh, are stored and used inside a secure platform authenticator. And this um, is supposed to be uh, able to protect against key extraction and also against cloning of the token. So for example, if I have an access to an enterprise network, I can't clone my, uh, my key and allow other people to use it. So instead of having an outside algorithm token, we can actually use our smartphone, which most of us have all the time, and use the trust zone in order to protect uh, those keys. And the way that uh, we do it is again use this attestation property that we talked about in order to prove to the server that those keys are secured inside the trust zone and they cannot be cloned. So now what we can do is actually um, step inside as an attacker inside the regist registration process, force the keys that are used for the FIDO uh, registration to be downgraded to the older vulnerable uh, version, and then we can Use the, still use the phone in order to authenticate, but we also don't need the phone anymore because we're able to uh, retrieve the keys. And we have a, a demo um, where we show how the downgrade attack can allow us to uh, extract the keys and then use um, a demo application for FIDO2 in order to show that we can actually uh, connect without using the trust on it all. Um, we had a very interesting uh, responsible disclosure process with, with Samsung. We started uh, by reporting the every reuse attack on Galaxy S9. They were very cooperative, and three months later, they already patched all of the affected devices. They're much more than just uh, S9. Um, we also uh, mentioned that there's a possibility for a downgrade attack on S9. They wrote to us that it doesn't really matter because nobody used uh, the old version. Um, then we reported the, the downgrade attack on S10, S20, and S21. And again, they say, okay, this is nice, but we don't think there's actually any uh, practical security impact uh, from this. Uh, so then we sent them the full paper, including the demo on FIDO2. And uh, this uh, caused them to change their mind a little bit. So after reviewing and reinvestigating, they say, okay, we feel that miss, maybe this has some practical uh, impact. And they released a high severity uh, CVE. Um, overall, uh, I think that over 100 million devices were affected by, um, by those bugs. And uh, another thing about it is that after one year where, the, where Alon worked on reverse engineering everything, um, the Laplace uh, attack group actually leaked the GitHub repo of uh, the Samsung Trust Zone. It was nice for us because we could actually see the code and the patches that uh, they made in order to patch, their, uh, patch everything. And, the, maybe the interesting part is that it's usually like commenting out. It's hard to see, but coming, in, coming out a couple of lines, then that's it. We simply don't allow the user to choose the ID, or we don't allow him to choose the version. And again, this is for the downgrade attack. Um, so, uh, in conclusion, it's 2022, but still, I guess it, we should keep on saying it. There is no security by obscurity. There was a lot of really long in, uh, low-level low cryptographic issues that could and should have been um, solved way before we looked at it. Uh, moreover, it creates compatibility gaps with the higher-level protocols. For example, the FIDO protocol does not know it actually needs to attest the specific method that was used to wrap the keys because they are not aware that there are any different methods. And it prevents um, 
uh, independent researcher from trying to actually uh, do some formal analysis and trying to prove the, pro the security properties of these protocols. Uh, we do have uh, a new Android attestation solution that is currently being promoted by Google, which we think is a good start. And also, we should probably uh, reiterate the fact that after decades of either use attack on ASGCM, maybe it's time to stop using this type of primitives and move on to, to misuse resistant uh, solutions. Again, we have, for example, uh, the Tink library that tries to do it. There are many others. Um, ASGCM should be retired. Okay, thank you very much. I'll be happy to answer any questions.